Yeah, nigga. Southside, Broad Gates, the cloth, nigga. You chilling with Mike Powers, man. My nigga MP. Feel me? Kept the MPs, you know what I mean? Southside, though, man. Y'all better chill. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. What's poppin'? It's your boy Mike Powers. And this is the very first episode of Mike at Night. A new, hopefully recurring segment that we hope that you will enjoy. Later on in the show, Porter House Production CEO Nicole Porter will be joining us. But first, this. From the land of hip hop, Nuke Bizzle. Have you heard of this guy? He had the unemployment scam song called EBD or EDD or something like that. Did you see this? So what he did was he assumed the identities of quite a few different people, was bringing in multiple bags from the unemployment scam, and what did he decide to do? Go ahead and put a nice beat to it, get his boys together, film a nice video where he confesses the whole thing over this smooth-ass beat. He actually explained the whole caper in detail, so some smart-ass prosecutor somewhere decided to take on the easiest win since Jake Paul stepped in the ring with Nate Robinson. I mean, honestly, what's the difference between this and just filming a confession and mailing it directly to the FBI? This is the type of dude that'll rob a bank, go change up his whole wardrobe, and be running around with brand new veneers in his mouth. Just hot as hell. So I know when I scam the government, first thing I wanna do is put a nice beat to my confession, upload it to a website where millions of people can continuously watch it on demand. Because you could bet none of the cats from your hood is going to snitch on you because you're doing so good. Look, floss all you want. It's 2020. Do I really have to say this? Listen, do not record your felonies ever. Not for a music video, not for a prank or a dare, and not with your homie while he's committing or bragging about committing a felony. Look, I'm not condoning any felonious behavior, but if you do do something illegal, your next three words should never be get the camera. And this guy's 31. Check this video out. Now, if you don't know what's going on here, I'm gonna advise you to lay off the K2 for a minute. Lance Armstrong over here lost control of his huffy. Some people will call this a devastating mishap. I have a whole nother term for it. It's called karma. That's right, bitch. With your goofy ass get being all out in the middle of the street with them goofy ass wetsuits on. Plus, I never wore a helmet, fuck out of here. Old Tour de France ass nigga. Nigga turned into a human pin cushion. Have fun pulling those pins out of your sternum, bitch. Did you hear about this one? Break dancing is now officially an Olympic sport. That's right, that's right. Great news again for hip hop. But I liked it better when it was called the floor routine. Nah, this should be lit as long as they bring somebody with some soul. You just can't be able to technically break dance. I need somebody that's able to stand on his head and stick his foot in his mouth. I told y'all, hip hop infiltrates everything. And the dopest part about this whole thing, the medals. Legendarily funny comedian Dave Chappelle is not with the funny shit when it comes to HBO Max and Netflix. Apparently Viacom, who owns the rights to the wildly successful Dave Chappelle show, is licensing the show out to various different platforms and they're not paying Dave Chappelle shit. Chappelle's team quickly fired off a statement. Fuck all that, nigga. Ain't a game. But that's not even the worst of it. Dave was especially peeved because this show that Viacom licensed to HBO, the show HBO paid money to acquire as part of their programming, Dave pitched HBO that show in the beginning and they passed on it. No! It's like the girl with the headgear and the braces that you went to high school with. The one you threw hot tater tots at her face. And then she grows into this and you go try to holler. Well, you already know what that's going to turn out like. I know you better get out of my face. And from the world of rappers that I never heard of, Jack Boy, seen here trying to convince you that that fart was not his, apparently had a very good 2020. The Kodak Black signee, instead of buying a Richard Milley watch, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, decided to splurge and buy his mom a $435,000 house in cash. And he brought the receipts. Paid off, no note, which means one thing is absolutely true. He is nowhere near as dumb as he looks. And it certainly beats what Post Malone did for his Ma Dukes. Takashi was worse. And that was my first dusty ass Mike at Night monologue. I hope you liked it. Trust me, it's gonna get better. Thank you for sticking with me. After the break, Porterhouse Production CEO Nicole Porter will join us. But first, this. Beat, 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 beat,
shoes that are hot, the shoes that are wow. They call British Nike. How you like me now? You should try some. Go out and buy some British Nike. Cause the shoes are so fly. Some people wear British Nike because they got style. How you like me now? British Nike will catch your eyes. Even the ones made for the small fries. Cause the shoe ain't nothing without the BK button. Footlocker and Lee Footlocker stores. And welcome back to the show. My very first guest on Mike at Night is the CEO of Porterhouse Productions, and she just dropped a fire album called Steak and Potatoes Volume 1 that boasts features from Rome Streets, 38 Spec, Sky Zoo, Rim the Villain, John Jiggs, and a slew of others. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Nicole Porter to the show. And I just did hit the transition right there. It's my first time doing this show. It's a one-man operation, but we made it work. All right. How you feel? I'm doing well. Are you? I am fantastic. Now, the elephant in the room, white lady, CEO of a hip-hop record label, Please unpack that for me and explain. When did you fall in love with hip hop? Um, I had a um, an older big brother who was a skater in the '80s, and so he brought home very early uh, N.W.A., um, Public Enemy, Easy E, and I can remember he would pay me to memorize verses and like perform them on the deck with him. So it was uh, since I've been like seven, eight, nine years old. By the time Death Certificate came out, I was like, Ice my Cube. Mind was blown. What's that? Ice Cube, Death Certificate. Yes. My mind was blown, taught me so many things. Um, it just kind of progressed from there. I think from Death Certificate, I really started buying all my own music and was like all in, fully committed. I ended up uh, as a teenager really until my early 20s, working in a mom and pop record shop in Indianapolis. Um, and it, we only sold basically hip hop. Uh, you know, it was the height of the mixtape era, at least in my city. Wait a minute. So you worked in a you worked in a record store. Mm -hmm. OK. And so you said your very first memory of really being involved with hip hop was you said N.W.A. You were memorizing lyrics. Is that correct? Yeah. OK. Is, is there, are you able to recite N.W.A. lyrics right now that don't involve the N word? No. <laughs> and I would never. I would I, never. Can you pull me on that stage? I'm not accidentally saying that. <laughs> that was a moment, right? <laughs> um, so uh, you almost got shot at this record store. Is that right? No. I, I've never almost been shot. Someone actually got shot and ran into the record store one time. But they fled before I could help. And you know the... Code of the street says if they flee, like there's nothing I can do. So we let them. We let them. It's very rare that I will ever go face to face uh, with a white woman who uses the phrase "code of the streets." Um, what'd you say? I had to be taught. Okay. You know, I, had to, I had to earn my keep in the record store. You know, I was right in the neighborhood, and and of course, everybody coming in was like, "Why is she here?" But then they got a grasp of my knowledge and it became like, a, oh, now we get it. Like Then they would come in and want to know what I was listening to, want to know what I recommended. So I definitely probably spent the first year in the record store earning my respect, earning my spot, which I was totally fine with. Well, I got a crack research staff here. Um, is, you met West Side Gun, is that is that correct? I did. One well, we time, it was pretty brief in 2018. What was that? What, what what circumstances led you to be in the same space as the Fly God? Well, uh, shout out to M80, Matt Markoff, who's an A and R based in L.A. Uh, I had actually flown to Minneapolis for the Soundset Music Festival by myself for my birthday, and uh, actually saw Matt on the side of the stage, and he motioned for me to come back. I'm not built for all day, uh, no shade festivals you know what i'm saying so i had on like a sundress mm. and some birkendorks some birkenstocks mm. because i was like yo i'm like damn near 40 she like my feet a1 and i need to make sure that i have some sort of natural cooling system so i was not dressed like i knew shit about shit so i go backstage i meet west side with these birkenstocks on and this black sundress 
And he's like, you know, taking the picture at first. He's got his arm around me and I look at him and I basically like kind of low key whisper in his ear. I'm like, do not make any assumptions based off my footwear. I promise you. <laughs> I know. So let me ask you a question. The feet, because you're in a sundress, you got on some sandals, open toes, right? What's with the corn game? How are we doing with the corns? Pedicures are all season. All oh, season. Okay. My feet are A1. Okay, because on my, you could strike a a, tri a kitchen match off my feet right now, like honestly, you could right. you could write your whole name on my shit. It, it, it's a genderless, uh, it's a genderless <laughs> activity. I invite you to visit your local nail shop and get that shit handled. I got something else coming up at the end of this show about metrosexuals, but we go get into that later. Let's talk about this album though. So, Steak and Potatoes Volume One. First of yeah. all, what made you decide that you wanted to form your own label? And put out and, and put out this music, and also you're in partnership with Rim the Villain, who was very close with Sean Price. Talk to me about the Rim relationship, and also what's really going on with the conceptualization of uh, Steak and Potatoes and Porterhouse Productions as a label. No doubt. So um, Rim and I basically formed a really good rapport over social media. I think that's how a lot of people are, you know, connecting with fans and consumers. I've always been really good at being a supporter. I like to put my money into the people that I believe in. I like to buy hoodies. I like to buy wax. And so after Rim and I formed that friendship, uh, he was like, yo, I really appreciate your musical opinion. You know what I'm saying? We had talked about other genres of music and other things uh, music related besides just what was happening um, in hip hop culture. And so he was like, yo, would you be interested in kind of like low key a and r almost a project with me, like coming up with concepts and maybe like getting some beats together, figuring out features. And I was like, I would be honored because I had been dabbling in making beats too. Mm. So uh, at one point he was like, I want to do an all women uh, producer EP. So basically it just kind of bloomed from that conversation. I was like, yo, I'm coming to New York. So we had like a quick lunch. And I was like, I don't just want to do a project. Like, this has been something that I've loved my whole life. Like, with all of me, it governs most of my whole life. Like, what can I do to contribute instead of consuming uh, all the time? And so it was just like, I don't just want to do a project with Rim. I want to do, like, a production company or a label. I want to connect dots and create, you know, actual substance to put in people's hands. So the compilation came from, Steak and Potatoes came from, us wanting to basically establish ourselves in the marketplace as people that put together premium shit. So mm. it was like, let us put this album together so that people know we know what we're talking about. We know who's hot. We know what sounds we want. And then we also took it a step further to say, these people have never worked together, at least at the time of the album. So like Sky Zoo and Shay had another track, uh, you know, eventually those sorts of things. But in general, we approached it as, who are the people we want to hear together on what production that they've never done before? And and that's what it was. Thank I you. have heard the album and there are no skips on it. And you have some amazing collaborations on there. Thank you. Amazing. Like some people that you really have never heard on the same track before. Yep. And it's, it's executed very clean. Great product. I see you got on. What is, is that Porterhouse merch you got on? Can you show us? It is. Yep. Yeah. Porterhouse okay. Hoodie. Yeah. Yeah. Those are definitely fly. And I know, so let me ask you a question. Do you yeah. get any pushback face-to-face -face or subliminally IG, Twitter from African-Americans that resent you being in this space right now? Absolutely not. Not a single one. There was no hesitation on working with me. I think shouts to Rim on that. His reputation is one of being an exceptionally genuine individual uh, who gets a lot of respect in a lot of places. But also a lot of people that I reached out to, we already had rapport again from me being a consumer. So like when I hit Danielson or Jay Nice, they already knew that I had been buying, you know, and that establishes like some sort of respect. It's like, you know, she's not out here just to like- Not a vulture, right? You, a you project. Yeah. really repping the culture. Really yeah. So let me, let me move on to this though. So, um, do you understand the trepidation on the part of some people that we've seen this long history of, you know, white people coming into black music and the white people get away with all the money, but the black people end up broke at the end of the day. Are you cognizant uh, of those concerns and how do you um, see yourself addressing those kind of fears coming from the African-American community? Mm -hmm. I definitely uh, think about those things, not only in music, but in life, right? Like, 
how I'm living my personal life. So it doesn't just extend to worrying about black artists or making considerations and checking myself in certain scenarios due to music, but just uh, the world at large. So um, for me, it's about the love. And so I never asked for, you know, handouts. I never asked for deals. I wanted to pay people right. I wanted to approach it right. I'm not looking to gouge anyone because again, it's, it really is, of course I want to make money. I mean, who doesn't want to make money, but I want everybody to get to the bag. And so really what I'm looking for outside of the money is the longevity to be able to make something sustainable to keep contributing. So I work a full-time job, you know what I'm saying? I'm not, I'm not out here trying to hide that, you know, I work a full-time job. I'm in school to further propel my actual career. And you're um, a mother as well. Now, listen, you're a mom. I know this. Are you now the cool mom because now you're doing records with Rome Streets and Sky Zoo and these guys? Mm -hmm. I was actually the cool mom before, but my levels have uh, elevated a considerable amount now. Actually, what, what what's most impressive is how much my children support me and how much they want to see me win. And so I think what's been great for them to see is that I have put everything on the line for this um, and that I'm unafraid of putting myself in this position to win or lose, but to most of all, keep going. Uh, and so I think it really motivates me to see how inspired my children are. You know, they're proud of me. I mean, they were proud of me before, but they're proud of me because they know how much I love this. I've often joked that my only legacy is my record collection. Like you gonna get some sneakers that are probably <laughs> worth some money and you gonna get some records that are worth some money. But other than that, I'm spending this shit while I'm here because I don't know how long I'm going to be here and I'm really trying to to live in the moment and and do the most. Do the most. So before I get over to the and I appreciate that answer before I get over to these um fun questions. I, I, talk to me about why Goody Mob is so important to you. Um man Goody Mob Soul Food came out when I was a fresh 15 years old <laughs> and um Obviously, since we keep addressing that I'm white, there's just some. Things oh, you're white. Yeah. You oh. Okay. Yeah. Some I didn't. You're little, I was thinking more translucent. <laughs> translucent, yo. I definitely glow in the dark. Shout out to all the redheads that can't get tans. It's all, it's all right. <laughs> That's what's up. So, uh, Goody Mob came out. Soul Food came out when I was a fresh 15. Obviously, I was already in in the outcast mode, um, but. There was something, you know, you can't, you can't teach yourself as a white person. I can't innately know these things mm. about the world. It was kind of how death certificate taught me. I could, there's no way I could ever know and understand the things that Cube discussed on, on death certificate. And Soul Food was the next album that hit me like that, but I was older. So mm. I'm 15, I'm entering, you know, a space in the world where people are starting to consider me a young adult. And the soul, like not to be redundant by the title or whatever, but the soul in that album, like I cried the first time I, I heard uh, cell therapy and, mm. and literally was just, or, or even thought process. Mm. Like when the, when the beat goes away and it's just Dre and CeeLo and I'm just like, this like moves me on the inside, like in a real way. Can you so do the album, chorus from like the song Soul Food? Can you do the chorus? Do you remember the chorus? I mean, I'm not going to sing, Mike. Come and get your soul. You ain't gonna do it with I'm not me. Not gonna do it. Oh fuck. <laughs> okay. So now, listen. Um, let's get to these four questions. <laughs> I'm like, I'm glad you did though. Thank you. Somebody gonna, somebody gonna harmonize. It might end up being somebody that we know that's gonna harmonize with me on this show at some point in the very near future. Which, uh, oh, let me ask you this. Not to belabor the point, but do you believe in seasoning chicken? I mean. Do like celery and raisins count? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We I'm kidding. Salt, salt and pepper at the minimum. Come on now. Not even salt and pepper at the minimum. Yes, I believe in seasoning chicken. I do have four children to feed who are much browner than me who would be like, yo, I, actually my, my daughter has openly thanked me for not making white people's mac and cheese. So I feel like, <laughs> I feel like I'm doing all right. Hey, so, I mean, you haven't been involved with hip hop for long enough. You got Lowry's in your, in your cabinet, right? Yeah. Okay. Gotta have, gotta have some Lowry. All kind, yeah. All yeah. My, my spice rack is stacked. All right. That's what's up. And, um, 
Which of these one hit wonders had the biggest cultural impact? Which of these one hit wonders had the biggest cultural impact? Mims, Vanilla Ice, or JJ Fad? I mean, I'm going to pick JJ Fad. Nice. <laughs> now, why? Why did they have the biggest cultural impact? I'm like, that's just personal choice. Like, if somebody's going to twist my arm and make me listen to something, but I like to dance. So, JJ Fad was like, you know, when we. Uh oh, listen. Can you do the look? <laughs> can you do the fast rapping part at the end? No, no. you can't. Nobody no. can. I don't think they know what they. I don't think they know what they were saying. My brain, my brain has consumed so much that there's like no room. Like I'm the type that's like I know that shit when it's on, but don't when it's on, right? right. Exactly. Because like I love like like a guy like Benny or even even my guy Fleet. I love a lot of his music. I can't think of his lyrics right now, but I can say G4 Ito. G4, Ito Flea, Pastor Sofrito, please. Those are some lyrics I know. Uh, I want to say this off the new album. I know you rock a lot of uh, fly sneakers, but what's the whitest thing you ever wore back in the day? I mean, I wore Birkenstocks when I met West Side Gun. There you go. What do you... There you go. I'm horrible. I'm failing at my job right now. Name three white female rappers that don't either overcompensate... Huh? The official shoe of white moms across America. Official. Official. So, name three white female rappers that don't either overcompensate, suck, or not a culture vulture. Name one. Uh, maybe Blinds Brixton of recent. Who? Blinds. She raps with Gab. Okay. Gets the Gab. Shoot me the DM. Also, you know what? We live in a world where I'm like low key scared to assume somebody's white. Like y'all can assume I'm white. Hey. You know what I'm saying? But like I have a daughter that's very white presenting, but she's mixed as a mug. So mm. she gets super offended when people try and take away her blackness. So I feel real delicate bouncing around like, are they white? I'm not gonna front. Like I don't really have any uh, white female MCs in my repertoire. Yeah, the answer is there are none. Um... That I mean, that I know. I don't know about this person that you just named. I'm a, you hit me in a DM. Drop I'm me the single. Going to. I'm only going to hit you with one joint because I'm not going to front like I like actually listen to the catalog. But there was one joint. That Give I me the like, one joint. Like, we might want to mess around and spin that joint. Uh-huh. Is is the is the pizza at Chuck E. Cheese worth risking your life in a bra? No. Okay. Nothing about Chuck E. Cheese is worth risking anything i'm like the i'm the antithesis of mothering i'm like santa isn't real we're not going to fucking chuck and cheese (laughs) too too furry didn't leave your shit yo um name one black male rapper who would fit nicely into a white boy band i mean the obvious just popped in my head was drake Perfect. I like that exactly. I like and he could Drake. probably be the lead. Like I like Drake. Drake has a lane that I I like, and I'm not gonna diss Drake for what he does in the least bit. I'm not gonna diss Drake for what he does. I mean, he's the yeah. sucker that talks a lot of tough talk on his record. Nobody he, believes that this guy is fucking tough. But I'm just saying he does make good songs. Let's just nobody believes that he's cute without a beard. There's just all kinds of nobody believes about Drake. But I'm still gonna do a whole bunch of car dancing when that shit come on. He's a pop star. I mean, let's just okay. He and he said it himself recently. And so he's a I'm good and he's a good pop star. Like, let's not, let's not be mad at the guy for that. Um, listen. So before we get out of here, I know you brought along a clip, uh, one of your videos. Can you set this clip up? What are we about to see here? So I think it's the video of the year. Um, it's from Steak and Potatoes. It's a track called Avion Flu, produced by Wavy the God. Mm. Uh, it features Sky Zoo, Shay Noor, and Eddie Kane. I think you're going to see the Eddie Kane uh, section of the video with our very own uh, Dame Dash in the back. Uh, Rim is doing some, <laughs> some Dame Dashing in the back for us. Yeah. But, yeah. So, yeah, okay. I think we have, I think we have, go ahead and run that clip right now. I came up with snakes and gorillas. From the slums, I'm a dinner. Can't show no feelings, brown hitters. Had to toughen up, nigga. Best out Brooklyn, where the kid grind at. 
But you niggas put the Jordan on your face like a Chris Brown tat. Had to struggle, build muscle, tussle, and hustle to reach the top. And the block was hot. We had the plot to get our spot, yeah. So niggas just can't step up to the plate. You gon' become the plate. Tryna fuck with the one that is great. Yo, that was dope as hell. Thank you for allowing us to show that. Don't forget, all you guys, guys and girls, go out and cop that. Porter House Productions, Steak and Potatoes, Volume 1. You know what I mean? So you can get more action like that. What's next uh, in 2021 for Porter House Productions? Uh, 2021, we are going to drop another video off Steak and Potatoes. I am a proponent of, uh, I wouldn't say milking a project, uh, but I would say I'm not of the currency formula for everybody, where mm. everybody thinks they need to drop every other month or so. Uh, so we're still, ro you know, riding with this project. There's 36 MCs on this joint. Like, there's no way you can tire of it so quickly that you're giving up on it. So there'll be another video dropping from Steak and Potatoes. Um, and then we do have a sincerely uh, selfish love project coming, um, which I'll go ahead and just say is basically a remix of my all-time favorite crew joint, which was 1900 Hustler. Mm. Uh, the Dynasty. So we tapped two separate crews, two separate producers to remake that joint. And it's gonna come out on uh, seven inch wax and come with some little extras that go uh, right along. If you haven't noticed, I like the extras. I like the packaging and the marketing of, of yeah. everything. So that's why when you get a pack from Porterhouse, it's wrapped in butcher paper and stamped like you've been to the shop. Um, so I think those things, presentation and all that matters. So that's the first thing on the table. And then there's a couple of other projects in the pipeline. Um, and then some people that have reached out that want to work. So I'm basically uh, taking it kind of slow, but also like planning my 2021, but trying not to lock in where I don't have the freedom to move and change my mind. Well, if, if what you did uh, in 2020 is any indication as to what's to come, then I anticipate it's going to be a very big year uh, for Porter House Productions. Nicole Porter, thank you for being the very first guest on Mike at Night. It was my pleasure. It was my honor, and I truly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you. Thanks for having me. And we'll be back with one more segment right after this. Yo, this is Jazzy Jeff. And how did I get my starter hat to look like this? The Jazzy Jeff Breakdown. First you grab the hat. Then you grip the hat. Then you flip the hat. Make sure it's a starter hat. Then you raise the hat. Then you slam the hat. Then you twist the hat. Then you turn the hat. Then you spin the hat. Then you smooth the hat. But hey, don't forget, look for the star. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Welcome back. Next up is a little segment where I respectfully tell people that they annoy me, and it's called Fuck You. <laughs> fuck you guys that shave your balls and wieners. What the fuck is that? Fuck you. Nigga, you trying to be smooth down there? For what? Nigga, you 40. It's give no fucks mode out here right now at 40. Oh, metrosexual striped socks wearing ass nigga. They want to say, oh, you got to shave it because the hair traps the funk. I don't give a fuck. My girl like, did you shower? Like that's about to stop some shit. She need to be ready to start smoking brisket up and through two full days of ripeness. Yes, it smells like a gym down there. A very tasty gym. And fuck all y'all trying to change me in the comment section. These motherfuckers is hot right now. I'm not shaving a damn thing below my nipples. You about to spend 20 minutes manscaping your beans and franks for some ass that you ain't about to get anyway? And what you gonna do when she look at you sideways and ask you why? Uh, I just wanted to see how it looked. Nigga, what? Oh, Ken doll ass nigga. My shit is gonna look like Angela Davis on a bad fucking hair day. I don't tend to that shit at all outside of washing that shit in the shower. I don't brush it. I don't color it. I don't braid it. I don't blow dry it, perm it, or put fucking designs in it. Matter of fact, the only time I think about the hair down there is when my girl is pulling one of my other fucking teeth and I'm pretending like I give a fuck. How exactly are y'all doing this? You got one leg up on the tub, pulling your ball sack, 
sack up so you can get to the back? Suppose your son accidentally run in there and see that shit. You stand in there, balls in one hand and a fucking Gillette in the other one. And your privates covered in shaving cream. I have no idea what the back of my balls look like. And I never want to know. For all I know, them shits could be high yellow. I don't know. What's next? Bleaching your asshole? It's a real question. The fuck you doing down there? Trying to look bigger. Oh, Roller Nichols head ass nigga. On some real shit, what y'all should be doing is shaving your fucking back. Niggas be so hairy they can't even smoke a blunt topless. One of them embers get loose and the whole house will be smelling like my mama's kitchen in 1982. Some of y'all don't know about curling irons I see. But I digress. In finality, fuck everybody that shaves their balls. Thank you for joining me for the first mic at night. I'll catch you on the next one. Peace.